some of you know I've been uh, for many years kind of asking myself what, what is the function of fix. Right? Part of my jo day job consists of uh, going into departments of big organizations and completely functionally understanding how all this stuff goes together and what these individual items do. So for the last couple of uh, year or so, Barry and I started asking ourselves the question of what does it mean to be an artist, especially in the 21st century. Right? So we have these regular talks. What I want to share with you today is essentially the beginning of a framework around a functional decomposition of what it means to be an artist. Right? And uh, for today, I'm going to focus on only four. Just so that you know, by the way, one thing I'm going to tell you is truth. Right? This is a map, and the map is not in the territory. Right? So this is one map, and some of the things I'm going to share with you are based on all the esoteric maps that I've taken into this world and made a pretty navigable framework out of that I'm finding functions pretty well. But the four things, you know, four functions I'm going to talk to you about is artist as a practitioner, artist as a creative, artist as an alchemist, and, alchemy, uh, and artist as a catalyst. And the last part in particular relates to the function of the artist in society. Mm -hmm. And what are you, how are you integrating with the world around you? So the practitioner level is pretty kind of easy, right? As a practitioner, what does it do? Uh, come on, make it. There you go. It makes art, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's the most easy thing time, right? What is an artist doing? It makes art. But, you know, of course, we ask ourselves, what is art? Right? And there's all kinds of different answers to those questions, you know, and all kinds of different styles and variations, and some cheesy, some happy, some this, and that. There's all kinds of things that are something called art out there, right? If you actually look for art, one of my favorite ones that I've found was this, right? the art of making a sandwich. So if you make a sandwich, does that make you an artist? Probably not, right? So there must be something else here that has a particular function that art fulfills in society, or that is different even on that level. Mm -hmm. And if you look back, you know, from that first caveman who was like, oh, oh, and his hand on the mud, and suddenly it's on the wall, and he's like, wow, this is so cool. Well, I'm probably freaked him out at first, right? The whole like, idea of being startled has to do right, with that, and realizing that, oh, there's something there, right? And everybody did it. When you got the next guy over, he got startled, and the next thing you know, the whole wall was full of handprints. Mm -hmm. And as they started to realize that, oh, this is, this is kind of magic, right? It turned into more concrete ideas. So there was these depictions of, of hunting scenes. They're actually not historical depictions of, hey, this is what happened, and I'm painting what happened. These are invocations. Right? This is what, what you wanted to see. Right? The idea of, oh, I'm creating an image, and by creating this image, by projecting this into the wall of a cave, I'm foretelling what is actually going to happen to us, right? And that goes then into more and more celebration of different values, right? At the end, advent of the early civilizations of human, humanity, we essentially have these big matriarchies, right? And the artwork, this is pretty, oops, where did it go? Oh, go away. There we go. Oh, there she is. There she is. Um, this art piece, because the building off is 40,000 years old, right? 40,000 years ago, people created this thing as an invocation of fertility. So we want fertile thing, we want growth, we want life, right? And they created totem, uh, essentially, or maybe uh, like a talisman right, in art. That turned, of course, at some point into the more rational and refined arts, right? Here's the Greek theater. And the Greek theater uh, was ultimately there to celebrate the values of the Greek society. Right? Every time we would get together once a year for the great festival of the noises, uh, all bunch, eat a bunch of ego, which is this um, fungus that grows in wheat. And so you have a lot of wheat representations in Greek uh, art and vases, etc. And they were not a particularly agricultural culture. This was actually mostly referring to the agro that grew on it, which uh, in 19, I don't know, it was uh, Mr. Hoffman synthesized as LSD later on. Right? So there's these people getting into a complete trends and festivities and celebrating their cultural uh, values together. Right? This kind of eroded into that, right? So you see, the only place where we see today these similar ideas of people getting together, being surrounded by, by visuals, by sound, by smell, but you still have it in church ceremonies, and ultimately, to some, to some extent, in theaters and operas today. Right? And the opera actually was a very concrete decision. There's a couple of people got together and said, art since the Greeks has become degenerate. Here's this painting over here, here's this dancing over here, here's some music over here, but they used to be together. The whole point was to create this immersive experience where you're fully blown away by this, what is happening, right? As a ceremony. 
So they actually at the time looked at what are the seven life of the arts. Like they said, what are the seven arts that are out there? And they said it's architecture, it's uh, visual arts and painting mostly. Today would probably include photography, uh, 3D art culture, sculpture, right, in terms of three dimensional space, poetry and uh, writing, right, the storytelling and the drama, the enactment thereof, right, uh, music and dance. Right? So those are officially, if you do one of those seven things, you're an artist as a practitioner, right, technically. Right? And uh, of course, an opera is one mixed form, so if you create operas, of course you would also be an artist. And then there's installation pieces, which might combine architecture and uh, visual arts and sculpture all in one piece. So there's all kinds of variations of it, and now there's all kinds of new versions of technologies that are available, and all kinds of mixed media versions. Right? But ultimately, on a pure practitioner level, if you create something that is an artifact in one of those areas, technically an artist. And that's just a practitioner, that's not all of it, obviously, right? Because there's huge distinctions between people who are making these things, right? And that goes a bit into the next thing, which is the artist as a creative. Right? And as a creative, what do you do? You become God. Right? And not in the big G-O-D sense, but in the sense of living up to being created in the image of the creator, right? Everything that is conscious of the ability to create is now reenacting something that is ultimately underlying this whole structure of this universe. Mm -hmm. And there's a lovely saying that in the teachings, in the uh, occult teachings, and esoteric teaching, it says, as above, so below. Right? There's ultimately very similar dynamics occurring on a small scale, as they're also occurring on a large scale. Right? Every single thing in this universe, if you look at this notion of fractals, right, you'll see, for example, the ratio of 1.618 in your arm, and how your arm is constructed, and how your leg is constructed, and your body, and the digits of your fingers. But uh, you'll also see it in how a cumulus cloud is formed, or a nautilus shell is formed. So there's some very simple building rules or blocks that the universe appears to be using throughout, no matter on which scale. Mm -hmm. And part of that is life. Right? And what is life? I mean, one of the first characteristics that we have when people ask, what if someone is alive, is to check for metabolism. Right? Is there input, process, and output going on? Right? Because that anything that is alive has that function. Right? We know physical level we eat, process it, and you know, get rid of it afterwards. Same thing with plants or animals seem to have those same functions of input, process, output. And of course, it's a it's a reflective feedback system. Right? So whatever is output becomes input again, and so on. Right? So there's a constant movement going on. In the middle of that is you. Right? And you're one of those input, process, output machines. Just like this planet, just like a tree, just like anything else, and as such, you have a rightful position in this world and a way to experience yourself, right? And the way you can experience yourself is, we find that there seem to be different neurological circuitry. In the old days, they called them chakras, so in the yoga world, they call them chakra. Right? Neurological circuitry is a more modern uh, term that Timothy Leary actually introduced, who did a lot of work on synthesizing, finding that across cultures, whether it's in India or South America or Siberia, different shamans and different druids and different uh, practitioners all ultimately talked about some of the same kind of things. Right? And it's very different ways of perceiving. Right? And there's also a notion that you essentially have these seven different circuits or seven different ways of experiencing reality. And you have three below and you have three above. Right? And the lower levels, you have the physical experience. We talked about that briefly earlier, that we have in common with plants. Right? Every plant has a essentially takes input of chemicals and physical things, processes them, and creates life from it, grows from it. Right? Okay, now let's go to the thing, I know what it is, I'm like, oh, it's on me, right? Um, there's the next level, the, the emotional territorial level, that's the same kind of frequency and same kind of consciousness that we have in common with animals. Right? Animals have a physical consciousness, but they also have the ability to move about in space. Right? For, for a plant, it's a spiritual work to slowly, slowly grow towards the light. Right? An animal has the capacity to say, oh, wow, I like this. This was a nice person. They fed me last night. Or, hey, this guy beat me or kicked me last week, and I'm going to go get away from that guy. Right? And that, that ability to move out in space. On the third level, you have time consciousness. Right? As humans, we have the ability to give symbols uh, to, to a particular experience. Right? By, by calling this a cup, right? I can now say, where did the cup go? And I'm creating time in that moment. Right? Without the ability to have that symbol, time wouldn't exist. 
like animals, everything is circles. Like an animal will know, oh, I'm hungry. It's time to feed me, right? But it's not going to come up to you and say, hey, you know, it's 5.45, and usually you feed me at 5.30. What's going on? Well, it's not going to have that kind of time consciousness. Right? And you have the fourth circuit, which is your ability to realize that you, you uh, essentially integrate the paradox of I and other. Right? And each one of those circuits comes with a different paradox. Like on a physical level, it's to be or not to be. But am I really here? Is consciousness creating matter? Is matter creating consciousness? I don't know and I can't know and I have to be okay with that somehow. Right? On an emotional level is how do I accomplish anything in this reality without violence? Right? How do I find the right way of asserting myself but not cause harm, not, not do that beyond appropriateness? Right? On the third level is uh, I know that I really don't know. Right? That's why I started with this is not truth, this is probabilities that I've collected and I really can't know. There's no way for me to know. I can collect probabilities and say, hey, this seems to be like that, or this model might work. But ultimately, I realize that. In this fourth circuit, the hard circuit, we really go into the point of I, and as soon as I say I, I'm separate from every single thing that is other. And, and to be okay with the fact that I'm completely alone as soon as I say that. And at the same time, there is no distinction between me and you, and there's, there's one fabric that connects everything. So I'm already one with everything, and one of the human race, and one of this planet, and already connected to everything. And that, that understanding that I can never be alone, but for me to have an experience, I need to be alone, is that next paradox. Okay? The upper circuits ultimately uh, relate to what you might want to call, what they we call it, extraterrestrial experience. Right? In the sense that these, these, three, these three here are essentially our interfaces into a three-dimensional reality that we experience here. But I have a body, I have sensory information and sensory input, I have emotional input, I have thoughts, right? and then I have that sense of self. And this next level is what we want to talk about, and part of the reason why we talked about the voice chakra earlier, is that unique expression. Right? This is the first step when you start becoming like God, and you say, hey, wait a second, I can do things here. Right? I can move things. I can create reality, and I can become consciously doing things. As a child, uh, usually around two, is when they, when they realize, just before the terrible twos, right? They realize that, oh, wow, I, I'm a creator of this reality. I can do this. Look, I did this. Look, I can do it again. And you know that you're annoying your mom and dad, and you're like, hey, look, I did this, right? So here's this first, in the new record, this is neurosomatic circuit. It's the first stepping outside of yourself to think about what you want to do with yourself. I mean, a lot of people live in a world of reactiveness. Right? Eighty percent of people on this planet don't have food, clothing, shelter every day. And consequently, their primary occupation is to take care of that. Right? And even in our world, where we live in a very, very rich experience, the majority of people seems to be in their lower chakras most of the time, which is in their head, right? or in this potential world that could be, but most of the time we run off the bills and doing this and going to a job and reacting. Right? So this is to be the first, take that time out. You go, hey, 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 what am I doing here? Who, who do I want to be? What is my will? What is my voice? What is my particular way of experiencing and expressing this reality? Okay. And such, you're now doing two, two jobs. You actually, on one hand, you're uh, pulling up, right? And you're, you're, you're reaching up towards, towards God, towards becoming more and more. Because as you now do this, of course you have to overcome anxiety. You have to overcome the, the, the death of self to some extent, right? you, because you're crossing into this other threshold. Right? So you're reaching up to this higher self to support you and give you confidence from here so that then you can take it and bring it down into reality down here. Right? So as an artist, you're kind of bridging these things and becoming self. And as you're doing that, that leads to the next thing. You could have done that by default to some extent, right? but if you're doing it consciously, you're starting to say, oh, well, there's tools that I can utilize. Right. First and foremost, even if you're developing your own creative process. Right? Like Joshua has a unique way of painting that only he has his process of how he does things. You have a different way of painting. You have a different way of painting. Everybody has a different way, you guys, of making your art, right? of making your creative expression occur in this reality. And it's your process. It has to be your process. Because if you try to make anybody else's process happen, it's not your authentic voice and it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. So as you become an alchemist, you go into like consciously transmuting, right? And that's what you're doing, you're transmuting self. You're not just reaching out and becoming God, you're actually consciously working these different circuits to get higher 
and higher in your capacity to perceive and create in this world. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Yeats, who was uh, also head of the Golden Dawn, and actually a lot of artists, like Picasso, Dali, etc., a lot of those artists were actually connected to esoteric societies, and there's a notion of the royal art of, chemist, uh, of, of alchemy. But um, here, Yeats says that the supreme art is a traditional statement of certain heroic and religious truths passed on from age to age, modified by individual genius, but never abandoned. Right? So there's something about that heroic part. Right? As a heroic journey, you have to be willing to go on that hero's journey. Uh, and especially normally, when you think about the difference between male and female spirituality, a lot of times that hero's journey is more ascribed to the male story. Right? It's the idea of, I have to go out and like, leave my village behind and slay the dragon and rescue the damsel in distress. Mm -hmm. But that's where we go back to every one of us has male and female inside of us. And so whether you're man or woman as an artist, if you're going, you're going to be on this heroic journey. Right? And it's a heroic journey of religious truth. I don't know if it's all religious and stuff, right? <laughs> Spooky. Well, let's look at religious. Right? What does this religious mean? Religious in Latin comes from the legale. Right? And the legale uh, comes from legale, obviously. So re legale. And legale means to bind or to tie, to connect. Right? And actually the root of it is R, which you'll find in Ars, Artis, which then means art and craft. Right? That's where we get art from. Right? So the root of R, as I said, means to join, to connect. It's an Indo, Indo, uh, Proto Indo European term. But in the same vein, we did yoga this morning in part because yoga means the same thing. Right? It means to connect, to bind. To, to, to make connections that other people might not be making. Right? So you're, 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 you're bringing something together, you're transmuting something by bringing certain opposites together. Mm -hmm. And so, what else it was? On one hand, there's aesthetics, and this is Mr. Schopenhauer's definition of aesthetics, who said that the capacity to contemplate perfection of form without any kind of worldly agenda, and it's the ability to connect to this higher self, and we talked about this reaching up earlier, and perceiving that, and perceiving the level, that's your capacity to be, uh, have an aesthetic experience. Right? At the same time, you're also integrating that with empathy, with your connection to the world around you and, and the signals that you're getting from this world. Right? So these are the two, essentially, extremes that you're bringing back together here, right? Your physical experience of being here and the idea that there's something higher that you can connect to. whole other story. Uh, that's a long, long other story. Uh, you know, when you talk about alchemy, they typically talk about transmuting lead into gold. Right? That's a typical idea. Oh, here this is proto-chemistry, right? Some people are just trying to make, make gold from metal. Now, one of the core rules of alchemy is that whatever process the alchemist makes the matter go through, he has to go through himself. Right? So here's our first indication of Alchemy actually being ultimately about psychology. Right? There's a lot of imagery here. Uh, these seven things up there, those are the seven official like stages that an alchemist takes a minute for. Right? The first one is calcination, you burn it. And after you burn it, you take those eight, uh, ashes and you dissolve them. Right? And then you separate the result of that, bring it back together, ferment it, let it, let it percolate, distill it to refine it, and ultimately bring the big picture together and have that uh, philosopher's stone that you reach. Right? Now all of those on one hand are chemical uh, operations, and then there are psychological operations. Right? And if you think about calcination, it's the idea of burning out something. Right? And all of us have passions and desires and things. Right? And for example, one way to, to burn out a desire is by constantly frustrating it on purpose. Right? And then to be passionate about something, you keep, keep going and keep going and you keep refraining from actually allowing yourself to have it. And eventually, it burns away. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's calcination, there's dissolution, which ultimately is dissolving your ego identity. Right? It's that, that feeling of, oh, I just feel I'm dissolving in the ocean of beingness. Right? You have that typically in love relationships, it happens a lot, right? when you have a partner and you're romantically engaged, and it just, your, your, your idea of self, your ego, just fizzles away, right? or when you're drunk. Right, everybody in your bar is a friend. Hey, everybody, it's like I'm just with everybody suddenly because I'm, I'm not myself anymore. I'm like, everybody's me. Right? 
So there is a separation. That's the clarification to say this is what this is, and this is what that is. Right? In the ability to analyze. Right? Analyze means cutting into pieces. Right? It's, a, it's a mental body again. And you'll see that those, to some extent, actually those operations relate to climbing up the ladder of your neurological circuitry. So that you stop acting from a pure physical thing. You can get over that. But like, I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Landmark and Est and all these, you know, the, the courses that came out of it. And there's this big story that keeps coming up in the middle you know, and then about how they didn't use that people go pee. Right? But the idea was to say, you know, you're sitting here and you, pee, you have to pee. Great. How important is that to you then compared to what's really going on right now? Can you hold that? Can, can you, you know, can you hold it? Can you do that? You know what I mean? Can you really exert your will to the point where you're taking control of your physical body? But when you look at yogis in India who are able to slow down their heartbeat or increase their heartbeat at, at will or stop it for days at a time and start it again. Shit like that, right? There's people that actually get buried underneath the ground every now and then there's a festival where they do that. Very odd stuff, right? All the people who are capable of, uh, Buddhist monks who were in, in the Himalayas who were capable of, in the middle of winter, like 30 degrees, sit outside naked and <laughs> breath a fire and similar things like that, heated their body temperature up to a point where you could put wet blankets on them and dry them in seconds. And so there's a capacity to actually begin to work with your physical system and the more intelligence you have around it in terms of input, right? what are you putting into your system, how are you processing, and how you, what are you creating with that body and how are you moving it, right? beyond the excrements, there's also the movement as an output of the body. So for all these different levels, you can be more and more aware. And the idea is that ultimately you raise yourself towards God-like being. Oops, first. So here's another uh, version of that picture, where essentially you see the, the seven separations, and here's the alchemist in the center, uh, who is ultimately, for this triangles, indicating that he's integrated. And there's a ton of stuff in this picture. You could probably talk about this picture for three hours by itself. The one thing I wanted to point out is one of the core aspects of alchemy is the integration of the queen and the king. Right? Here's the king in the other aspect, and here's a scepter and a shield to show his royal power. Right? And then you also know it's a cave with a dragon that's just uncontrolled, unbanned, unconscious, that's waiting to ultimately to, you know, run over. Over here, on the other, oops, I'm sorry, wrong button. Over here, on the other hand, you have the, the queen, and she rides on this fish in the water, showing that she has already mastered those unconscious seas. Right? She's already cool on that end, but she's also, you know, holding an arrow and, and a bow as an indication of the wounds that she's carrying for being here. Right? It's a female path versus a male path of the hero's journey, the female path of loving, kissing the leper, right? of being able and willing to love anything that shows up in front of you, no matter what, right? that capacity. And again, to remember, we both have both paths in us, and our job is to integrate it. And on that note, that's what they're exactly talking about in alchemy, right? They're talking about the king and queen, those two, right? the solar energies, the lunar energies, and the spirit above, and what do they represent, the king and queen? Right? They represent the masculine and feminine, like I said, right? the male active element, right? and the female receptive contractive element, and they relate to your brain. <laughs> Delicious brains. Right? Here's your left and your right brain halves. Right, and a lot of the, if you look at the esoteric teachings, a lot of the work that is there is about integrating those brain halves, of ultimately holistically using them. Right, if you think about a lot of the exercises we did in today, like this exercise, right, there's an exercise that actually creates integration between left and right. right or there's another beautiful exercise that Alexandra showed me at some point, where you cross over your hands and you do go for a mantra with your fingers. But by doing this, by crossing over, you actually improving your, your uh, brain functioning, right? and you're actually creating more centered thinking all around. Right? That's why a lot of the alchemists and secret societies like Masonry or Golden Dawn, etc., are mostly for men, right? because they essentially said, hey, we are by default more left brain oriented, and these tools, right? these systems and these numbers and these very left brain kind of ways of, of, of depicting reality, including some of the ones I'm sharing with you right now, are there to help me connect to this, right? And have my own chemical marriage in, in, in my own experience and integrate myself as a whole being. Right? So that this way I get to have the power of the women and I get to have the power of the men. How cool is that? Right? And so this is about 
the, uh, the function of the integration of the artist. Because as an artist, too, you have to integrate both. Most, most, most a lot of artists that I talk to say, oh, that's a, I'm a right brain person. I can't, I can't do that left brain stuff. I'm a total right brain person. Sure, there's celebrate the fact that you're actually connected to your right brain. Now, in order to create anything in this reality, you still need the other half, right? Your right brain might give you inspiration, but the left brain gives you the discernment to say what is what. Like when you guys were painting earlier, there was a choice. Do I use this color or that color? What is the size of the canvas? Right? Am I going to put a stroke here? Am I doing a stroke there? Right? These are decisions that need to be made. Right? And that's where the art is very, it's not wishy. Right? Art is very specific. It is a discernment. Right? You're, you're cutting away material. Like, like Michelangelo, you said, you're liberating the sculpture from within the stone. In order to do that, you have to cut away and cut away and cut away. And that is also the left brain. So that's one of the myths that I like to help to dispel a little bit because it's not about right brain or left brain. It's about fully being you. And for me, artists are those prototypes, they're doing that, they're constantly transforming and transmuting themselves. Right? Even you guys coming here and choosing to be at this workshop today and experience and step over the anxiety of a woman and experience something new. Oh, that's going to be yoga. Is everybody really okay with that yoga? Is it going to be difficult? All these little anxieties, right? the problems that uh, he was talking about earlier in terms of I have to solve this somehow. All these things, that's what you're constantly transmuting. Right? And as you're doing that, as you're transforming yourself, Something bigger happens because every time you do that, you do it for everybody else and you're beginning to transform the whole world. And there was an interesting test done a few years ago where they had a thousand meditators meet in Washington, D.C. and meditate on peace. Right? And the whole point of that experiment was to see if it could actually affect the crime rate. And the police chief initially said, oh, it's ridiculous, you know, fucking happy shit from the West Coast, you know, da 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 da. Next thing you know, they actually dropped the crime rate by 20% that summer. Nothing to say, yeah. And there's been a lot of studies done like that where individuals, or even if you think about 9 11, there's a um, project where Roger Nelson, from, originally from Princeton, has random number generators all over the world. Right? And they send, and their job is to create random numbers. And then they do. The only times they don't, and there's densities, is when there's stuff happening in the world. Like literally in 9 11, all of those random number generators all over the world produce less random numbers in that moment. Mm -hmm. So here's something that was massively experienced by people and it literally had an effect on something as random as a random number generator. Right? What do you mean they produced random numbers? Meaning that the job of a random number generator in this case is to throw out strings of ones and zeros that are 128 bits long. Right? So it just throws out strings of ones and zeros. Right? One zero, one zero, 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 one zero, 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 zero. Just a random number. Right? And normally, like when you're doing an experiment with dice, right, if you roll a dice six times, technically you should have every number once. Right? And if you do that long enough, you will find that you have a certain amount of ones, a certain amount of twos, a certain amount of threes, a certain amount of fours. Right? And you have a totally proper distribution. And in this case, what happened was they weren't as random anymore. Suddenly they were repeating patterns, they were doing things that were out of that normal thing, which technically disqualified those numbers as random. Right, so there's a less, in terms of the pattern distribution, right, like sometimes there's a number here, sometimes there's a number here, sometimes there's a number here. In this case, suddenly all the numbers were over here for a moment. And all the numbers were over here for another moment. I mean, so that's what I mean by less random. So but suddenly there was patterns. Or what did, no, it, it just they seem to be correlated. It's all, you know, in a good scientific way is to first and foremost never assume causation. Right, nothing causes something else. It seems like that maybe, right? And there's effect to everything. There's a law of cause and effect, and everything has an effect. But oftentimes things are correlated. In terms of something is happening here, something is happening here, there might not be a direct connection. And that's okay. Right? But that's the world of quantum physics, where even you can take a particle, any particles that have ever encountered each other, even if you separate them light years away, if you change the spin rotation of one of them, the other one will also be affected instantaneously which is very strange, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, going to entanglement. Mm -hmm. Generating particles at the same time and affecting one and the other one. You know, they're, they're separated by like a meter or so, mm -hmm. but they're still reacting to one another. Yeah. So they're shown in the experiment. So here's these quantum correlations, right? Yeah. And as so, come back to this function now, as you now doing this work, guess what you're doing it for everybody, right? Every time you overcome anxiety, 
every time you uh, develop courage in a way, every time you pull yourself out of the hole you were in, every time you're doing that, you, you do it for this whole field. Mm -hmm. And that gives us the next function, the last part is that the artist is a catalyst. And as a catalyst, you create culture. Right? You're actually actively changing the way around you. Right? Because if you look at culture, right? Every one of us is born within sort of a cultural operating system. Right? Like I was born in Germany, in the south of Germany, very different from the north of Germany, very different from France, very different from America. But, right? you know, some of you were from here, right? Uh, Barry, for example, was born in LA. He comes more from Chicago, very different cultural operating system, but still American. Well, it's still an operating system that we all grew up in. An operating system, when I say that, it's coming back to those different circuitry. How are you conditioned in those? Right? Like, for example, what's your relationship to your body? What's your relationship to your emotions? What's your relationship to thought? Right? And if you look around the world, look at a couple of different cultures, you'll see that some cultures are way more physical, right? and, and, and stronger, and, and do dances in the culture, and, and are physically active. Right? Other cultures are known for their emotions. Right? If you go to like, Italian opera, you know, <laughs> even, or a French love drama, right, or South American, you know. So there are certain emotional things, and some cultures are stronger than others, right? But some things are really rational, right? Everywhere I go, people are, oh, you're German, you must be an engineer or a thinker, right? And there is something to that, because even language lends itself to very structured thinking. Right? So we have certain culture that we all grew up in. So within that culture, most people kind of adapt to what's going on. Right? I mean, you sort of pick up traditions, but you, you don't go too far from the herd normally. Right? Outside of those freaks, there are artists. Right? <laughs> and freaks of two E's. Right? And freaks of two E's because they're freeing themselves from their cultural operating system. They're moving outside of uh, what mother, father, preacher, teacher taught them. And they're starting to look at the borders and say, hey, what's, what's going on out there? Right? They go where angels fear to tread. They're willing to go a step further, expose themselves to situations that other people would say, yeah, not such a good idea. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they travel, you know, and there's a lot of expert, like people like Hemingway, or other artists, or even the whole uh, uh, Paris culture in the 20s, right, with, with artists from America being in Paris, and exposing themselves to different cultural operating systems, and therefore starting to connect them, to, to, to cross-pollinate. Mm -hmm. So there's that aspect to it. Sometimes, well, this doesn't work so well, and sometimes... Just all along, you're really wondering, like, what, what, what's going on? Why don't I feel like part of a society at all? Right? And there's something very fundamental to it. There's a reason why, statistically, there's a higher, a relatively high suicide rate among artists compared to some of the other professions. Um, because, even on a biological level, something interesting is happening. If you think about this as a, literally, like a bacterial culture, right? if you have a bacterial culture, and the outer bacteria go out and explore the environment, and when they come back to the colony with the new receptors they found, and the colony signals back to them, we don't need those receptors. Do you know what the, kill, uh, what the cell does? It kills itself, literally. It just dies. Shrivels away and dies. So even on a biological, f physical level, the experience of, of having stepped outside of culture, having found something really exciting and new, and trying to bring it back to the tribe, and they say, yeah, we don't need that. The first physical response of yours is off yourself. Right? So that's why it's very important to be having some of the tools like the yoga, like the community that we build with each other to support each other. Right? Because then we can be okay being out there, transmute it, be, be that alchemist, right? and really come up with a new meaning that we can then give to society and insert it there. Right? Does anybody know what a meme is? Okay. You do know genes, right? We all have genes. And genes carry biological information. Right? A meme, M E M E, is something that carries cultural information. It's an idea, a behavior, a value that you're encapsulating in some form, right, in some form of artifact, and you're inserting it into the cultural operating system space, meaning that you bring new ideas, new ways of looking at the world into the world. Right? And by that, you might actually transform society and change how people live and how they do and go about their daily business. And so there's a function of ultimately affecting not just for your own personal work, but also for taking the work out there and actively shaping culture and consciously shaping culture that can be looked at. Mm -hmm. And the point of that is really because we have a world full of problems. And this is like in, 19, in 2000, the United Nations decided to say, what are the 15 global challenges that we're dealing with? Mm -hmm. 
And you'll see things like uh, development of whiskey water, democratization, organized crime, all these things. The one thing that struck me most up here was this, right? Long term perspectives. There's a lack of what could the world look like tomorrow. Right? How many people know that? How many people don't even know that for themselves? And are willing to plan, are willing to go and jump outside of what is today and say, what could my life look like? Right? Envision. And I think there's an important function here to say, uh, not just for yourself, but for the world, to begin to invent it. If you think about Jules Verne, right? Jules Verne hadn't written in 80 days around the world. If he hadn't written 20,000 leagues beneath the sea, in all likelihood, millions of kids would not have become engineers and tried to build those things. Right? If I hadn't thought about it, where would it, who, who, where would it be? Right? So here we have an opportunity to, on one hand for society, and then at the same time for our own personal life, because that's something really difficult to do. Right? Because traditionally, we're taught to worry. Right? Worrying is really easy. Oh, this could happen, that could happen. Oh, this could not go right, this could not go right. But to actually step back and say, well, I'm going to allow myself the creativity and the space to vision for my life and what it could be. It's an important function, and here's again where the, where the artist, through the ability to be imaginative, I would think has an interesting role to play, right? which is in part where we this created the Artist 21 series, uh, where every second Saturday of the month we invite people to say, hey, what does it mean to be an artist in the 21st century? Right? Because today you have all kinds of technologies available to you that weren't there before, right? in terms of utilizing your art to, to insert memes into the cultural operating space. So here's this whole big kind of strata with different pieces. Right? There's the, the personal art, the actual the experience that you guys had today of I'm putting this pigment on this canvas, right? and it's a very conscious act of creation and co-creation, right? because you need the light to reflect in certain ways, and this and that happen, all these things that are coming together. Right? So there's the art of making art. Right? You have the art of being creative as such and allowing yourself to be creative and imaginative and imagine what the world could look like. Right? You have all the other tools that you have available now today from technologies to knowledge to uh, community to make that happen. Right? So as you go forth, right? Uh, oops, I'm not blinding anybody. Thank you. Just a little bit there. So as, as you go forth, you know, think about what you, what you can do with the art that you're doing. Right? Outside of a the, the personal healing process, also the idea of how can you ultimately, by doing that, heal a lot of people out there. So, thank you.